If you had to take the choice of living for one year, choice A is gloves, choice B is mittens. What are you gonna choose? Which one's a gimmick? The nerves in your feet innervate everything above them. So if your feet are just stuck in a shoe and there's say an inch of rubber or whatever between the bottom of the feet and the floor, all the feedback loops get turned off. I want your connection to your feet to be as strong and important to you as your connection to your hands is. Welcome to the Restore to Explore podcast from the Foot Collective. We're on a mission to empower humans to restore their natural health and function from the ground up so we can all explore movement and life with freedom and confidence. All right. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Restore to Explore podcast. My name is Nick, and today I have the honor of speaking with Bill Maeda. Bill, thanks for being here and uh, offering your time to share some wisdom with our community. Thank you, Nick. It's an, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Beautiful. Uh, so for those who don't know you, um, maybe we just start real general before we get into movement or foot specific stuff. I'd love to know, you know, what's your story? How did you get into physical training? Uh, and you know, what gives you a sense of purpose to get you out of bed in the morning? I'd love to just hear a bit about Bill. Okay. Um, you know, I guess what got me into physical training, I think, well, I don't think I've, you know, I've recently learned by recently, like within the last year that I have suffered, I wouldn't say suffered because I didn't, it's not suffering at all, but I have, I have ADHD. I just kind of discovered it recently. Um, which explained a lot of the, I guess, the questions I had about myself from my entire childhood till now. I was always a real hyper kid. I think from the time I can re remember remembering, I was, I, you know, I'm I'm the middle of uh, the middle of three children. I have an older brother and a younger sister, and they're like really normal and calm, and and I was just just freak, you know. <laughs> I just drove my mom nuts. And, and I always just thought I was just the way I am. But so I've always been very active. And the funny thing is, because I was such, I, I've also had a lot of problems focusing. I didn't do well in school um, ever. And um, I also, that also carried over in a, like in the athletics, you know, a lot of, I was a naturally for a Japanese person, especially of my generation in the 70s and 80s, 90s, I was considered kind of big. I'm about six feet, I weigh about 200 pounds. And so the coaches in, in school were always trying to get me to play sports. And I would join these teams, but I was easily distracted. I'd end up going to the movies and just <clears throat> messing around and not getting anything real done. So I, I didn't do a lot of sports in, in, in school, but I started training myself at around age eight. Um, I, I think what actually got me into training myself, like actually taking time to do push-ups and sit-ups and, and throwing a bunch of karate kicks and things was when I, a lot of people start this way. Um, what I saw, I remember distinctly, I saw some Bruce Lee movie, might've been Enter the Dragon or something. And when I saw him like take those nunchucks and go, ah, and all these muscles and everything, and just, I had never seen that. And then when he started moving those nunchucks and just watching those muscles just jump around, that was that I remember that just had a big effect on me. I just I could just see just power and energy. And that's just something that really resonated with me. So I started to I started at that age and then um by the time I was about maybe 14, I received my first weight set. And uh, just one of those, you know, I don't, Nick, how old are you? I am 35, I think. Okay, so, um, all right, uh, that's a year after I graduated um, from <laughs> high school. So, cool. So you you might not have had these weights that were filled with, they were plastic weights filled with cement. Like, those were probably from the 70s, maybe the 80s. I do and, remember, my parents had a weight yeah. set, and it was like these right. sort of gold plastic weights so they were filled with sand exactly. or at least i thought yeah. It was sand. Yeah, yeah yeah they're like a gold colored ply okay yeah. so you've seen those okay. all right so um that's what i had and i started doing uh and then i got my first real olympic barbell set i think when i was 15 
And I just, uh, by that time, by 15, I was a really, I was pretty messed up. I was kind of involved in, I used to smoke a lot of weed. I, you know, I, I was very, very insecure. I've struggled with that my entire life. Um, and so I, a weed was kind of something I was using both. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was using weed to help me with I, some of my ADHD um, uh, symptoms. And um, also to just bond with people. I'd never really been a part of a group. I always felt like I was on the outside. So, but the weights are the one thing, the weed and some of the other things I experimented with, or I could, you know, those were not long-term solutions, but the weights and the physical training to this day, those have always been my dope. Um, it's just, yeah, I don't, I think another issue that um, I didn't realize until somewhat recently in my past is, you know, you hear a lot of guys that are on online and on social media, they all tend to be like Navy SEALs, ex-cops, you know, ex-athletes. They, or they came from places of like some pretty hard places and a lot of struggle. And, you know, they've been through some tough things. And, uh, you know, I grew up pretty privileged. And, you know, I grew up in a very safe neighborhood. I went to a private school. Uh, I never had to catch the bus and things like that. And in a way, that kind of is, is it, it kind of, um, it made me oh, a little bit harder on myself. I used to be really hard on myself because I had all these problems and all these social issues and personality issues. But I was thinking, How, what's your problem? You don't have a problem because I'd read about other people that I thought had real problems and and that just really kind of it. It was in a way, uh, it it was a little confusing for me. But the weights were a way that I could self-impose hardship on myself. And I I didn't know at the time that there's something to going through struggle. It's it's vital to the development and the discovery of oneself. I just intuitively found out that every time I crushed myself in a workout or went out on a hiking trail or went out on a run and I just brutalized myself that I just felt in my soul in a way that nothing else made me feel. And um, so, yeah, that's what kind of, but I never did it for athletics. And, you know, I, I, I didn't even really do it for like to attract girls or anything because um the person I was, especially in the, my teenage years, early twenties, my thirties, I was, my, I did know that it, at least for me, personal uh, muscles wasn't enough to attract the kind of girl or woman that I would have wanted to hang out with anyway. Um, so it was not for that. It was always just for the way it, it made me feel on the inside because I wasn't playing sports. No. And, you know, I guess people would say, oh, well, you got some big muscles in it. But that was very superficial. It's not like I identified with that. So, yeah, um, like that was the symptom of the thing you were actually getting benefit from, which was just, you know, forging character through challenge. And I think, <clears throat> first of all, I can relate a lot to the ADHD or ADD tendency because I definitely, if my parents hadn't put me in swimming, when I was younger mm -hmm. and kept me busy, right. I would have been in a lot of trouble. And I never did great in school because I never found interest in what they were teaching us. So I think that's probably a me lot too. more relatable <laughs> than you think. And, and maybe even says more about the boringness and the you know lack of alignment between the way children are supposed to learn and the way we've created systems of education, which don't really align. So, so it might yeah. be more the world than you, but uh, you know, the way I've sort of come to understand it is like having a lot of energy is a superpower if you harness it right. And it is. I think that, I think we used to have initiations when, you know, in, in ancient cultures, we, children or adolescents would have these initiations, right? These like hard challenges where mm -hmm. you get sent out into the woods or you do a sweat lodge or you do something with the adults that really like puts you at your edge and makes you discover who you actually are when you're in that sort of struggle mode. And right. I think we're missing that now. So we have to self-impose that. And it sounds like you, that's sort of what you discovered through training. And I think that's really awesome. Yeah. You know, and then I, I and like I said, going back to this, I always felt guilty about the life that I had because 
it seemed like everybody around me had something like they're struggling with money. They're struggling with, or, their, or if they had a lot of money, their parents were just, it was very dysfunctional families, or if they had great parents and, uh, but they lived in, you know, rough neighborhoods and everybody seemed to have some kind of thing going on. And like I said, I was looking for that. I just intuitively, I felt like there was something missing from my life. And um, so my, my dream at, was to go into the military after high school. And I tried, but uh, I had a, I did try playing football in my um, sophomore year at, in high school. And I ended up getting an injury that required surgery. And there were two stainless screws put in my shoulder. So when I went to apply for um, military, um, they wouldn't take me based on, they called, they considered the screws prosthetics and I was permanently uh, not eligible for any military service. So now I'm like, oh, because I the whole time I was in high school, I was just training myself. I thought I would want I thought I wanted to be in the special forces, which I now know in hindsight, that was probably good. I didn't try because uh, there's a lot of things that I would have not been able to uh, maintain that standard. But um yeah. So, but I, yeah, and my search for this struggle for some kind of, yeah, I, I thought, ah, the military, I can maybe find it there. And I didn't. So <laughs> that's when, um, but I'd been training through high school the whole time. And even back then, a lot of my classmates, um, they were asking me to train them. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, but I would show them what I was doing. And I kind of enjoyed it. And, you know, it was kind of fun. And, and these were guys, these were kind of like the cool guys, like the surfer guys. You know, I grew up in Hawaii, so there were certain groups of guys that were like the dudes and, and, and the, in Hawaii, the, the surfers, you know, um, they were kind of at my school, they were, and they started like paying attention to me when they started seeing me kind of getting built up. They used to tease me and kind of give me a little a hard time. But then I started, but I trained them. And then from there, I just, it was a natural extension. I, you know, after I graduated from high school, I just started training people. I moved to Los Angeles to learn how to be a trainer in the early 90s. I actually tried to live in Venice Beach. Um, but then the neighborhood I was in was a little kind of sketchy. So I moved into uh, an area called Mar Vista. It was close by and a little nicer. But yeah, so that uh, and that's how I kind of training is pretty much aside from working at McDonald's one summer when I was 15. Pretty much training is all I've ever done since, since forever. Amazing. I guess, you know, to bring things to feet, was there ever a light bulb moment? Like, I don't know, you know, if you, were you ever in shoes? Cause shoes have changed a lot in like even mm -hmm. the past 20 years, right? They went from being these things we wore to protect our feet to this weird period where they were like really built up, cushioned, rigid, and you know, we were sold all this technology, quote unquote, mm. in shoes, which I think messed up our feet quite a bit. <clears throat> and now you see people kind of understanding that and going back to these very minimal natural shoes or, or training barefoot. Mm -hmm. And so was there a point that you remember where you went from wearing built up shoes or, or even just becoming aware of feet? Because I think everyone has their own kind of light bulb moment from my experience, when I talk to them, uh -huh. if they do train barefoot, if they understand foot health to some extent, everyone has their own kind of light bulb moment where it's like, oh, I'm ignoring my feet. Maybe I should pay attention to them because it's kind of like ignoring the foundation on a house. Like it might not end well if you're mm. ignoring the most foundational element that everything's built on top of. So I'd love to know your journey or, uh, you know, your process of sort of understanding feet. And I think I saw somewhere you posted on Instagram that a lot of people wear shoes to cover up weak feet or, or, or shoes allow people to cover up weaknesses in their feet. So yeah, I'd love to just uh, hear about your experience or your journey to sort of, I guess, understand sure. feet. Okay. Um, first, you know, I, I recall that my saying that, and it was a, I think it was on a short little, it was on an Instagram short. And I realized that, you know, that was kind of a possibly harsh or judgmental statement. Um, because I only have a few seconds to, to try to fit what I'm going to say in the video, right? I realized, yeah. wow, that actually made me sound a little like an asshole because it sounds like I'm judging people who wear shoes 
kind of harshly without knowing their motivations for. And what I meant to say is that we sometimes um, inadvertently, like like just walking, if you're, if you're used to wearing shoes all the time and you just step outside to get the newspaper, just a little bit of gravel under your feet is uncomfortable. And unconsciously, mm -hmm. your body, is, its job is to protect you from anything that could be a threat. Like, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's just going out to get the newspaper. Your body doesn't know if you're just getting, going to get the newspaper or if you're going to cross the Sahara and that's what you're walking on. So it's going to want to start steering you towards things that will protect you. So that's what I mean. It's not people are consciously like pussing out and saying, oh, my feet hurt. I need to. Pro no, uh, I mean that it's just an unconscious and a natural and understandable thing. But for me, um, I would say the advantage I had was growing up in Hawaii when I did in the ninth, I was like a little kid in the 1970s and then into the eighties where things were back then it was um, Hawaii's economy. Everything was different culturally. So I grew up barefoot um, in Hawaii. Even as a teenager, I recall being pretty, even an adult, back in the eighties, I could go to the mall, like the biggest shopping malls barefoot and walk through any store. And nobody even thought my high school, it was the, it was called, it was called Puna, it still is called Punahou school, very exclusive private school. Uh, in high school, you could go barefoot. Uh, even now, even now to this day in 2024, um, high schoolers at Ponoho are allowed to walk around barefoot if they want to, if I'm not mistaken, unless something's changed. So it's, it's culturally been kind of my thing. And I always considered myself like my, my late mo mom and anyone that knows me, I used to consider myself like a little caveman. So my, my whole shtick was like the way you see me in my Instagram videos is basically a 55 year old version of me as a kid. I have always walked around barefoot, shorts, and no shirt. That's just, that is my, just, I've never really been into clothes that much. So That's your MO. it doesn't, it doesn't just extend to shoes. It's also shirts and ties and, and everything else, you know? So um, I never really thought to me, putting shoes on was weird, wow. you know, like, like having to, it, yeah, even at in at, in PE in high school, I would forget my shoes a lot because I just like to do everything barefoot. I just felt I could grip the floor. I, I was more functional. I was more reactive uh, without things on my feet. And then you know Nikes and a, uh, well, I guess it started with Adidas in my generation. Uh, Adidas, and then we had Re, uh, Reebok and Nike. Then and with those big cushion soles and those felt really good i mean i have to admit when i'd run in those um i could run faster and farther in those but um and i don't think i wore them enough that they actually that my feet regressed because i was still barefoot so much of the time i only wore those when i ran and if i had to work uh, i worked at california pizza kitchen for a little while so i you know of course i can't uh, go around barefoot there but yeah in general Barefoot has just been kind of my thing. I wasn't trying to be different or because uh, back then, a, a lot of kids in Hawaii, we were just barefoot. That was just a thing. But then martial arts, if you want to know, like going into an adult thing. And now my insistence on it is I've always been of the mindset that um, if my feet are strong and capable, unprotected, then if I do choose to cover them in something, they'll, they're even stronger and more protected. Meaning like I will sometimes wear minimalist um, shoes on a 10 mile run. And I have a lot of, I know a lot of people that can run much farther than I can and much faster, but in shoes, if we actually wear the same minimalist or say we have a, a, a race or, or a challenge to go barefoot, I will tend to win or I will do better than them. Um, and I would rather be able to go slower for a long distance without my feet breaking down because durability is at my age, especially now durability is more important to me than gaining 
strength or getting faster. I just want to be harder to break. And being barefoot uh, makes me, not just through my feet, systemically, I feel harder to break. Because my feet can handle hard pounding and jumping rope with five pound ropes and those ropes slam into my toes and my toes are fine. Then I know, obviously, if I protect them in shoes or boots, they can take even more abuse. So I just like, that's why I don't like to wear weight belts or anything. I want to, I, first, I want to know where I, I'm, I'm also a huge fan of knowing very quickly and truthfully where I'm weak. Because the more I know where I'm weak and I start addressing that, even if the exercises required look kind of lame or little, little, you know, they're not the coolest looking things on Instagram. I know if I address those links, then the things that I'm good at and that I, I'm strong at, I'll be even better at. So I'm, I'm huge on, that's why I don't like to wear a lot of, that's why my, my whole thing is barefoot and shorts. I want people to know they don't need, if, if people want to get any inspiration from me, at least um, my take on it is minimal. Like if I could go out, well, not, not for you guys, but uh, you know, to me, I should be able to work out naked. You should be able to fight naked. My thing is, 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 is martial arts. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you can do that, then you can load up with gear all you want. In theory, you should just be a little more durable, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. And I think, uh, it's good to know your honest limits, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, if <clears throat> I think sometimes people, and again, I'm not judging people for what shoes they wear or for why they wear shoes, but I think it's a reasonable assumption to say that a lot of people depend on shoes as a crutch to let them do more than they would be allowed to do otherwise. Completely. And so I think sometimes it allows people to actually go beyond their limits without having immediate mm -hmm. feedback of where their limit is, which in, at the end of the day often results in issues upstream. So it's like, would you rather be forced to do less and be really aware of where your, where your edge is? Or would you be rather be allowed to do more than you're supposed to and get injured somewhere without having any hints leading up to that? And I think a lot of people, it's just a lack of awareness, right? They're not, mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, frankly, they forget they have feet. They just, it's out of sight, out of mind. They look down, they have shoes. They don't have feet. And so I yeah. think it's easy to accept that feet are just these dumb blocks that we stand mm -hmm. on and not these like really, you know, 26 bones, 33 joints, layers of muscles and mm -hmm. just a really dynamic structure. And, and I don't think you get that true appreciation until you actually train barefoot, until you actually, you know, reclaim the sensory connections between your brain and your feet, because there's so much rich sensory input our feet are capable of taking in. But when we cover them in a, in a pillow, that we essentially kind of numb them. And the brain says, well, we don't really need to have that sensory input anymore at a high fidelity. So let's just, you know, prune away all the nerves in our brain that are in charge of feet. And then we, and then once you have a weak foundation, you, you just, it becomes a governor to doing other things, uh, upstream, yeah. right? like you're, you're not allowed to lift as heavy of a weight because your body just doesn't trust that you're stable. So, um, for something so simple and it's so interesting too, that the culture in Hawaii is just one of, uh, is a barefoot culture, right? And that is, you know, I bet you, if you gauged foot health and strength and resilience of the average person. People in Hawaii probably are just like an abnormally high level compared to the rest of the, of the Western world, which kind of yeah, just, you know, just debilitates their foundation. Right. Yeah. In Hawaii, um, especially when you're um, when we were kids, if you couldn't walk on the, you know, in the, the stream bed with all the pebbles and you couldn't walk. Well, we don't walk on the reef anymore. But back in the day when we didn't know better, we would walk on reefs and all kind. And, you know, you had to be able to handle coral. And even if you get like sea urchin in your foot, you just pull it out and just keep going. <laughs> and it's just, so, yeah, you actually got you would take some flack if you couldn't if your feet were like tender or. Right. Yeah, it was. Yeah, at least in my when I was a kid, it mattered. I mean, you, you need to be able to run in the mountains on a trail and not need shoes. Yeah. So it was that cool. and our, that the culturally it, it was helpful. And if someone starts working with you today, someone new mm -hmm. you've never met before, you start working with them on training strength and resilience and just a, a more rugged body. And they come, they show up with these like crazy looking Nikes with layers of cushioning. Um, do you mention feet 
Uh, and if so, I, how does that conversation go? So how does that conversation yeah. go? Brand new person. What are you saying? How are you wording it? I'm always curious to see how people are explaining this because some people do it so elegantly with simple in simple ways. And uh, yeah, I'd love to know how that conversation goes. You know, I, I explain, you know, everyone's heard the feet are the foundation of the building. You know, if you're a high rise and, you know, you have a weak foundation, then the high rise is going to fall over. Everyone kind of fundamentally understands that. But um, what one time, um, I guess I'll give you a little quick story. You know, when remember when the Vibram Five Fingers came out? Yes. And they uh, and they and to this day, whether it was back then or now, they they look kind of freaky, and people still double take them. I remember um, a, probably we'll say a client. Well, the first time I came into my my uh, my studio and I was wearing them, and they look at those. They're like, what are those? Those are ridiculous. And they said, and the guy said, you know what? Those shoes make me just want to step on your toes. <laughs> I'm like, go for it, man. <laughs> so I was like, I'm sorry. You probably heard his that foot much. on your feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, he says, that's a, and basically we got into this friendly debate. And he says, oh, that's just a gimmick. You know, what, what the, what are shoes, what's a shoe com company going to come up with next? I said, this is a gimmick. He says, yeah. I said, so, okay. So barefoot or whatever, because this, this is basically like my foot will just, you know, a little, things of fabric around each toe. It's like a glove for my foot. Right. He's like, yeah, it's a gimmick. I said, okay, so if you had to take the choice of living for one year, choice A is gloves. Choice B is mittens. What are you going to choose? Which one's a gimmick? Right. He's like, oh, I'd choose the gloves. I'm like, why? What, what, what does this matter? Because these are like gloves for my feet. So what's the big deal? Okay, okay. I said... Yeah, so I, I tell them that um, basic, without trying to get too, I said, every toe, when we step on a surface, only in modern society is the floor predictable and level and constant. Only in civilization. This is actually what we call normal. Floors, sidewalks, malls. That is an aberration to our evolution because just outside of all of this level, nice, hard, even predictable stuff, there are pebbles, sticks, mud. Every step you take is a different, it is actually a different surface. Every step, like you, if you're walking on gravel, each time your foot lands, the pressure receptors in your feet are getting a completely different, I'm doing this with my hands, they're getting a completely different input every step in fact just rolling off of a step so i said the yeah, i guess the feedback the nerves in your feet innervate everything above them so if your feet are just stuck in a shoe and there's an inch or say an inch of rubber or whatever between the bottom of the feet and the floor you see, basically you have like numb flippers on your feet they're just there's no feedback loops all the feedback loops get turned off and that i and i tell them that well, a lot of my clients don't care but i feel that's when people overuse their prime movers and that you know they they're not getting feedback from the smaller structures down there i got a little off the topic here that's not a simple no that was perfect and, but, what, and just... but what i tell people is basically you I want your feet, I want your connection to your feet to be as strong and important to you as your connection to your hands is. I said, because if we put your hands in mittens for a year, do you think that's going to have a good effect on your forearms, your arms, your shoulders, your neck? Do you think that's going to have a positive or a negative effect if you can only choose one of those answers? Because it's the same thing. That's if I can simplify it for them. I said that's the same thing. Wrapping your feet in shoes, and then elevating the bottoms of those feet half an inch, an inch, or some of these. I'm not going to name names, but some of these so-called orthopedic walking shoes. They look like I'm, in the '70s we had these shoes called famolaris, that like disco kind of looking things. Were the I mean with the wavy thing I mean they were cool looking, but 
yeah, I said, what do you think is what, what's going to work out better for the feet and everything upstream of that? Like, I tell them, imagine putting not just mittens on, but mittens with a fat layer of rubber right here. Right. So it even restricts how you can bend your hand. I said, and that's one that I, and I always ask them, I say, hey, if you're okay doing so, I'm going to ask you to actually, because I evaluate people before I actually, before we agree to work with each other. Yep. And I let them know the evaluation will be done barefoot. So I kind of don't have to, they already know um, that when we, uh, when they do their evaluation, it's going to be done barefoot. And in Hawaii, when, it's not a hard sell because even right. people that tend to like to wear shoes, it's culturally pretty easy. So, but if they want to kind of get into things, I just give them my mittens and gloves thing. And I tell them, yeah, same thing. If, you, if you're coming to me to improve physical function, number one, I ask you to trust that I will, that some of the things I'll ask you to do are in, are in the best interest of that goal. And it's going to start with not your feet. I actually, I, t I like to get the toes. I said in a recent video that I posted to YouTube that the strength and ability of my big toes means more to me than how big and strong, what my squat is, what my bench press is, or how many pull-ups I can do. Yep. Because if my big toes and my toes are just dead, numb, I can't curl them, I can't extend them, I can't spread them, then everything upstream of that is probably equally dysfunctional. It's just a display of strength rather than actual integrated function. We wanted to take a quick break from the episode to let you know about our ultimate free foot health resource. If you're listening, you've probably already started the journey towards improving your foot and movement health, but if you're still wearing conventional shoes most of the time, that's anything cushioned, heeled, narrow or rigid, it's kind of like taking one step forward and two steps back. Knowing what shoe is right for you though can be super confusing. That's why we made the Guide to Foot Freedom. We've taken everything our team of foot health experts have learned over the years and synthesized it into one handy manual, packed with all you need to know about unleashing the natural power of your foundation. You'll learn how to understand your feet, the truth about modern footwear, the five Fs for finding natural footwear, plus a step-by-step -step guide with training videos to help you assess your foot function and improve it so you can safely and seamlessly transition into shoes that will finally give your feet freedom. The best part is, like I said, it's absolutely free. Just head to thefootcollective.com and click learn to find the free ebook, The Guide to Foot Freedom. You'll find the link in the show notes. Now back to the episode. Yeah, and I think when you assess people barefoot, you can, I think it's actually the highest return on investment for observing mm -hmm. function is you look yeah. at their feet. And like, when I look at someone's feet, I can tell so much about, you know, probably I can get a high degree of probabilities of what is happening upstream or what is not happening upstream to result in that, you know, movement pattern or function. Oh, level. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think when you talk about all the sensory input and all the, you know, stepping on like little pebbles, the idea that 33 joints in each foot have six degrees of freedom means there's basically infinite combinations of motion in the foot. Infinite. And, yeah. and each piece of input, if you think of as a nutrient, it's like if all you're used to is flat, hard, uniform surfaces, mm -hmm. you get one nutrient. And if each yeah. different input is a different set of nutrients, people's feet are just malnourished. And it's not, it's not that you have bad feet. You just have malnourished feet. And once you start to give them nourishment, the beauty of the body is like, it doesn't matter how old you are, your body will adapt. And once you give yeah. it nutrients, it will process that and reclaim a lot of that function. It's just, I think it's mostly an awareness gap with feet. People just don't realize the importance of feet and also the fact that the consequences of just modern footwear that's stiff, ramped, cushioned, pointed. I think the pointed part is a really nasty one. Pointed part is, yeah. The shoes just that's aren't shaped like that feet. big toe that's crossing over the yeah. number two, you know, all that. And the big fat bunion that, you know, it's just, yeah. And it's very funny um, that people cringe at Vibrams, shoes that are shaped like feet. It's like you wouldn't wear a helmet that's shaped like a triangle because your skull is a sphere. And yet with shoes, yeah. we just think, oh, shoes that are shaped like feet. That's weird. Mm, I don't want those. Those can't possibly work. Yeah. So it's just a right. weird cultural blind spot. Um, and like you said, in Hawaii, it's probably an easy sell. But I think in 
you know, in the physio clinic, I used to tell people to take their shoes off. And there was like, people would look at me like I had four eyes. They're like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. I don't do that. Yeah, do My you? feet stink. What do you? It's like, ironically, uh, they only stink because you wear shoes all day. Yeah, it, it is. It's weird. It's, it, it is because of that. Yeah. I have, similarly, I've had, you know, guys that kind of insisted on their, their jet fighter looking running shoes. And I said, Hey man, would you say your feet look more like a flipper or a bullet? I just kind of like blindside them and they go like, well, like a flipper, man. I said, then why does your shoe look, look like a bullet? Cause it looks cool, man. Yeah, literally like people buy those and admittedly, yeah, those shoes do look, they look cool. You know, they, cause you know, like, um, I'm partnered with um, Vivo Barefoot, and I love their shoes. That's the closest to a normal-looking shoe that I can get, but with a Agreed. you know kind of a wider toe box. But if you really look at the shoes from above, they still you know you know you know and and <laughs> Vivo, if you're listening, not I don't bear with me. Wide toe box shoes, kind of you know those clown shoes. You know how clown yeah. shoes have that big front end. Yeah, if it's a if it's got a an actually wide a toe box that can actually let your your feet and your toes spread out, it should kind of look like that. Luckily, from the side, they look very sleek. Yeah, right. But um, yeah, no, you've got to get yeah, got to get over the look thing. And a lot of people, understandably, um, they choose their footwear how according to how it looks. It's very much a a big part of. A one's fashion sense and the statement they're trying to make i fully understand yeah. but and i'm I've not never, against that yeah. just don't do it at the expense of your feet getting broke down yeah exactly for sure I, i'd love to know who you're you know you mentioned bruce lee before i'd love to know along your path you know mm -hmm. from when you were eight until where you are now who are your biggest influences um as a trainer as a as a human who wanted to develop his body uh, who were the the most influential people in your life in, in terms of physical training? Okay, in terms of physical training, I, I'd have to say the first, well, um, if we're being honest, Arnold Schwarzenegger, just like everyone from my generation, you know, um, the Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding, I think it was, that big fat book that he made. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I went through every single page and I looked at every picture and, um, yeah, it starts, he would be my, for my fitness, like it's weird. If I had to say somebody inspired me to, tr to train and to want to get muscles and, the, and the way I wanted my muscles to look, that'd be far and away, um, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, interesting. Oh, you know, if I if I had to credit one human on this planet from because I knew Bruce Lee was a smaller person than I was. And I had a lot of small Chinese friends that kind of looked like him. And I knew that my body type would never because I was kind of like a big ham when I was younger. You know, I was just big. I was, and, and I knew that. And but when I saw Stallone um, in the Rocky movies and then in First Blood, and then in Rambo and then Rocky four and holy shit that th those images of Stallone and then Dolph Lundgren as Drago, uh, those images, the, all the time I was in the gym, it was Stallone, but of the guys that actually were in the physical culture, like form, like it started with Schwarzenegger. And then in the early 90s, Charles Poliquin. Mm -hmm. I used to subscribe to Bill Phillips, um, the EAS magazine, Muscle Media 2000. And um, Charles Poliquin started writing it, had a column in there. And the, I learned as soon as that magazine came in the mail, I would rip that open, go right to Poliquin's column. And everything he said was just gold. I mean, I, yeah. Um, and then later, um, in early 2000s, of course, Pavel Tsatsalin, I became obsessed with the kettlebell. The, the moment I saw the kettlebell, I just knew that is something I, I don't know what it was about. It was like, it was like what seen an, uh, I'd have to like seen a new gun or a new weapon, something that's never been, you know, like, like the way 
other cultures when they first saw a rifle or a pistol. Right. They must say, oh, there's, I don't know what that is, but that is the shit. And <laughs> um, so the kettle, and then, and then, and I like Pavel Satsalin, his kind of more minimalist, stripped down approach to diet. You know, like I, I don't get tied up in diet is where if people, people always ask me about diet and I don't, I, I just don't have much to say. I grew up in Hawaii. I'm a local boy. I eat what I want to eat and um, for better, for worse. And if people saw like, okay, I'm, on, I'm trying to be honest with people now. For the first three and a half years, I was just throwing down little clips on Instagram and just having fun. But now that people keep asking me and I don't want to misrepresent what I am and what I'm doing, like this is a bowl of corn f frosted flakes, like with sugar. Okay, um, who makes it? Okay, it's, it's from Whole Foods, so it's not the full-on Kellogg's one, but it's sugar, and it's milk, and, and yeah, probably and it's made with corn and probably GMO corn. And sorry, I don't really care about that. Um, I, you know, I I kind of know what I can eat and when I want to eat things. There are certain things like if I were to eat that after I had ice cream, that'd feel that'd be disgusting. I'd, but there's sometimes I feel like I need sugar. Yep. Sometimes I feel like I need carbs. Anyway, I got a little off the tangent. So it's and then, okay. So, Just to put a pin um, in that. I think people demonize yeah. sugar, but it's not. Everything depends on context. It's like I think so. You you know you can't say whether pizza is good or bad for you until you also explain the context of which it's consumed. Because if you consume mm -hmm. it once a month with friends, you have a great time. You don't have any consequences. Pizza is good for you. If you eat pizza yeah. three times a day, pizza's probably gonna be bad for you. So, yeah, I think it's it's more like eat mostly real food. Other than that, it's like you can have fun sometimes and eat things that aren't real food. Just like listen to your body. And I, I love that you say you don't have much to say about food because I don't actually think there is much to say. It's like literally just mm -hmm. eat mostly real food. If you're yeah. not feeling good, change what you're eating until you find what makes you feel good. Um, yeah. Yeah, the context for this is I, I, I got in here about seven minutes before we're supposed to go live. I don't want to be late for these things. I also want to make sure that my internet and that this Riverside, you know, all this is compat and working. I put it on last night, but I'm really like, so I was real. And I came in from working a bunch of clients since 530 this morning. So I was hungry and I don't want to have low blood sugar for this conversation. So normally this kind of simple sugar and milk and stuff, I know this is going to like, boom, it's going to work fast and we can have a nice conversation. But if I'm also in a rush and I, I this is not going to be my first choice snack. If I have time to grab, I got steak in there. I got a lot of good things, which I'll probably have after this. But right now this works and it's brilliant, appropriate. Yeah. I appreciate the honesty and I appreciate the punctuality also. It's oh, uh, of course. I, I big no. respect for that. No, um, I, I'd love to I know on the, t uh, like, you know, we talk a lot about feet. So it's actually kind of interesting for people to tell stories that aren't necessarily always related to feet. As long as we do a mm -hmm. little bit on feet, we're good. I'd love to know if we zoom out and talk about health. Yes. One of my favorite questions to ask lately is in one or two sentences, how do you define health? And you fully have the right to change your mind in 10 minutes. And I won't hold you to this, but I'd love, I really think it's actually a, uh, for often for people, it's a difficult thing to pare it down, but I'd love to know just off the top of your head, how do you define health in one or two sentences? If someone asked you, you know, this might sound a little airy fairy, but in recent years, I have found that when I go off, I'm sorry, this is going to be more than a few sentences, but, okay. um, I, okay, let me start. I, I define health in how how I'm relating to how I am relating to myself and basically the integrity of my actions and how they affect me and those around me. Because um, so there's no diet, there's no life. I don't have a morning routine that I can tell you about, but I've learned that if I am living authentically, I used to be addicted to um, cannabis. I had a very strong, I mentioned it earlier, but that 
what started in, in my teen years, it stayed with me for decades. And, and I don't, I shouldn't even say I was addicted to, I will always be addicted to cannabis. I will never not be addicted to cannabis, but the whole time, but I was using that to deal with personal issues, a lot of insecurity, a lot of self loathing that I had that over the more recent years, I've started to kind of work and work with and come to terms with, but all of the, and you know, I had cancer in 2012, um, it's pretty severe stage three colon cancer. I had 13 inches of my ascending colon removed. I had six months of heavy chemo. Um, but the person I was back then in the, in the years leading up to that was a pretty toxic person. I, I didn't realize how much, how harsh I was on myself, how harsh I was on other people. Cause I believe that how we treat our, and this is no, no secret, but how we treat ourselves is, basically reflected and and it's on how we treat those around us our loved ones and strangers and otherwise i just went through the world in younger years as a much harsher person i was kind of you know i was always I was, and i was always like i always made like i'm big and strong and i'm a badass but i was always scared i was scared at the mall i was scared when i was walking my dogs you know, people would look at me a certain way or say something to me. I'm always like, what, what? You know, I was like always just very insecure, very defensive, but it's because I felt vulnerable and I didn't understand myself. So sorry, I got off on a little uh, uh, kind of a longer winded answer, but my that was way better now, than anything I could have hoped for. So don't apologize. Oh, well, and thank, thank you. For you. The, um, I think when we're vulnerable and we share authentically, I actually think that's the most resonant, powerful way for people to learn is just to hear, sto hear honest stories of struggle because it's easy to think everyone's got it easier than us. Like if, I, mm. if you hadn't shared that with me, I would never have known that you faced those struggles and become the person you are today. And I think I it's faced them. inspiring. Sorry. Well, thank you, Nick. But yeah, and you know, those struggles, I continue to work with them to this day. I, like I said, I understand, I know enough about addiction to know uh, I will never not be addict, an addict. I will always be an addict. I could die for a hundred years, come back to life, I'll still be an addict. And, and that helps me. That's not, you know, it's not like uh, a self-defeating mantra. It By understanding that, that is what gives me the strength and the, the understanding to truly not go back to that person and being that way. As soon as I feel like I'm safe, I drop my guard and all the demons come back. So I need to understand certain things. And I still struggle with, um, to this day, I'm, I, you know, I, I understand, but now I'm okay. A lot of, a lot of insecurity I'm finding out is trying to, to conceal it or hide it from other people. It's weird. When you're trying to not to look strong, that is when I found I'm the weakest. When I'm always because I'm I'm just I'm wasting energy trying to put up shields everywhere. Oh, that and now that I'm okay, like when I was driving home, I was trying to get home fast from work to be here on time. My when I drive a, my daughter turned 20 years old today. It's her birthday. So the car I am driving, I purchased when she was four. There is no paint on the hood. There's no paint on the roof. And recently somebody sideswiped it and took my, my driver's side rear view mirror off. I, when I'm driving, I have to use a hand mirror to change lanes. I take a freaking hand and I'm like, and I'm getting pretty good at that now. And on the way home, a bunch of young kids, I don't know if they're teenagers or 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 high uh, college, they drove by on the H1 freeway and they go, Bill Maena, <laughs> Bill, what's up? What's and I'm looking and they're just like, and I have no freaking rear view mirror. And you know, and I just had to laugh. Like the older version of me, I would have been super embarrassed, right? Because obviously they they recognize me from Instagram or TikTok or something. And I would have been like, oh, wow, that's that's not my image to have this beater ass car with no freaking rear view. But now I just laugh. I said, what's up? Because what who am I trying to fool? I don't I'm 55. I don't, yeah. I can't afford a new car right now. 
I got my daughter in college. I got another daughter in private. And that's fine. I don't, yeah, if my car is, I, whatever. Um, I'm proud of my daughters and what they're doing with the money I am spending that I could have spent on a car. So I'm good with that now. But it took a while for me to arrive at that. I I think it's, I know if I, in my younger years, I spent exorbitant amounts of energy trying to look good to people I didn't know or care about. Yeah. And when you, when you drop that, it's like the energy surplus you get by not trying to always engineer how people perceive you, who mm -hmm. don't actually end up mattering like strangers. You know, you try and look good or look a certain way. Once you drop that, it's like life is just lighter. And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember when I did martial arts, the guy with the black belt in the mm -hmm. gym was the calmest, coolest, like he didn't have to be worried. He was certain he yeah. was secure in himself because he knows that he had done the work to get to a point where like he didn't have to fear anyone. Mm -hmm. And yeah. even though people feared him, you know, yeah. in combat, like mm -hmm. he was just the most, the nicest, most approachable guy. And I think it's like, I always aspire to be the person who does the work to feel confident so that I can just chill and be really gentle and soft and not, not be worried. And I think that's a really yeah. powerful insight where to me, it's like when you got two daughters in college or university and you're driving a beater mm -hmm. car, like I admire that. Like that's a legendary move because you clearly prioritize your money on things that matter. Cause at the end of the day, you're not going to look back in 20 years and be like, geez, I wish I would have wasted way more money on a car that's worthless now. Exactly. Of spending, spending money on my daughters. Like no one ever. Said yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, to, to younger people who are who are listening and they might be thinking, man, I'm, I'm wasting a whole bunch of energy trying to make myself look better to people that shouldn't even matter to me. I, I tell them, Hey, don't try not to be that way right now because that's part the way I feel like I got the benefit of this discovery was by spending a lot of time in it. And I believe it's part of developing yourself anyway to be kind of like to to try and put on a to project an image that you know deep inside is might not be actually authentic, but when you're young, you don't really I didn't really know what authentic was anyway. I didn't know because there was when I was like sometimes really generous and gentle and kind, that to me was authentic. But then when I'd go and like roll or fight with somebody, not mean kind, but just, and that, that real gnarly guy, that to me was also, so I was confused by that. So I tell people, don't, don't just try to like try to Zen out right now and be like an old man like me and, and be like, Oh yeah, I'm not gonna let it. It has to, in order for you to learn how to not let things matter, they first have to matter way too much. So that's why I also tell some of these younger people that go, man, I want to be chill like you. I said, well, you know, in order to be chill like me, you know, I have to be as much of an asshole as I was for as many years as I was, because I believe that was part of the, uh, that's part of the process. Yeah. So it's so yeah. similar to training too, right? Cause people might say, mm -hmm. well, I want the muscles you have. It's like, well, the muscles are just a byproduct of the life I've lived. They're not actually mm -hmm. the thing I desire or the thing you should desire. And yeah, I think that's a really good point where it's like, we all have to just discover who we are, which is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, you know, just to kind of end it off, what do you think has been the, mo what, what wisdom can you offer a young person who kind of, cause I think in today's world, if you don't actually spend time thinking of who you want to be and what matters to you, the world mm -hmm. will impose things that it wants you to be or look like, or, or things it wants you to think matter. How do we trim away, like, how do we actually discover what we want, who we are? I mean, this isn't obviously a short answer, but I, you know, what wisdom can you share for someone who's like, I don't know who I am or what I want or how I should be in the world. Um, how do they, you know, what's, what, you, what advice can you give? You know, the only, t it, when I was younger, because I was a big, I was afraid. It didn't, I mean, I was a big kid. I had a lot of muscles. I looked pretty scary as a teenager and as a young adult, but. I was always afraid to the point of put to the point where I, pr I, I, and I had very little confidence in my ability to confront or overcome challenge. So I think one of the big mistakes I made as a young person was to, I was always saying no to, or bail or, or running away from anything that was outside of my comfort zone. And well, for me, everything was outside of my comfort zone. So I, 
I missed a lot of opportunities to challenge myself. And, and when I, and, and what I know now is it is far better to say yes to, 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 uh, to take the challenge. And this is very tr trite. Everyone's heard this, to, to take that, that challenge and to fail, but to know that the previous version of you would have said no. So the win in whether you actually overcome the challenge or not, the win is that you, that that's a new version of you, whether you won or lost, whereas if you do not take that challenge and you, sorry, if I can, if you pussy out, then you're just that same, you're, you're the, the, and there's no, and yeah, you didn't necessarily lose when you didn't decide to, and it's, I'm not talking about fighting or it could be just like, Hey, you want to join this club or you want to volunteer to uh, pick up trash on the beach? And it's like, Oh no, there might be pretty girls there and they're going to think I'm a loser. So no, I'm going to stay home. And literally that's the kind of way I used to think like, Oh, the people are going to think I'm a loser. Or I'm going to do something wrong or, or my trash bag is going to break when it's full of trash and everyone's going to think I'm a loser. And I, I was always, and, and, and I, I didn't realize that it, it would be way better to let that trash bag break on the beach and, or to let a hundred girls think I'm a loser at the dance. I, I there's like, I didn't go to a bunch of dances, you know, like uh, uh, social events in college because I was just so scared of like, either people wanting me to drink because I can't drink and what they'd think of me if I can't just, and, and I missed out on so many things. And not only did I miss out on those, I missed out on being able to fail at those, which I now realize I, I tell people when I'm trying to teach them how to jump rope, don't count how many times you can jump rope, jump in a row, count how many times you can fail and don't stop practicing until you have. So when, if you're jumping rope and the rope hits your feet, that's one. Start jumping again. Oh, hit your foot two. Oh, hit your foot again. Now you got three. Keep going. You need ten. You need you need to get to ten. Amazing. And and that's what I think. I I tell people it's like it sounds weird, but try, if you can make, if you can just detach yourself from whether you win or lose, and make collecting the loss or the fail the win, hmm. that I think would have because. I don't, people sometimes ask, I'm glad you didn't ask me, what would you say to the younger version of yourself? Because I, I, I would have to say, I wouldn't say anything to the younger version of myself, because if I said anything that mattered, then that would have changed the outcome I have now. And I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't be married to the, the woman that I'm married to. I wouldn't have the two daughters that I love so much. So, yep. um, but if there was one thing that a practice or a, something I would have done differently, it would have been to collect failures um, oh, yeah. and to, to look at it like that, to, to, to not worry about whether I, cause gosh, if you only worry about winning, the chance of anyone winning, anyone is always less, I think, than the chances of losing, right? Statistically, no matter what it is. Yep. So if you, and I just took that, that fear of failure to such a degree, I cheat, I, I, I wouldn't even say cheated. I just didn't realize how many things I missed because of that. All of the most important le lessons I've learned in my life that have given me the most value have come through hardship and failure. Yeah. And if you, and if you don't lean into shit that scares you, you literally forfeit the honor of having those lessons and, and, mm -hmm. you know, having a, a fork in your path that brings you to a better place. So that's brilliant wisdom. I think that's a good place to end it. I'm so thankful that you took the time today and, uh, you know, carved out time out of your day to literally share wisdom with the community. And I think we did our part on feet, but I think everything else you said apart from feet was actually, I'm excited to listen to this one because it's, um, I think elders passing on wisdom that, that might be trite and simple, but actually hearing it from someone like yourself who is like humble, you know, just like I admire Bill Maeda, I just met you, but I just, I think your honesty and your willingness to share is so refreshing. So thank you so much, oh. Bill. Thanks for listening, everyone. If people Nick, want to know more you. about you, where do they find you? Oh, Bill Maeda on Instagram, Bill Maeda TikTok, um, and on YouTube, Fit Pro Hawaii.
or you can just go to YouTube and search my name and you'll get to Fit Pro Hawaii. Really? And those are, yeah, that's it. But Nick, thank you. It was an honor meeting you and, and spending this time with you. And, and thank you for allowing me on your platform. You are most welcome. And uh, if you want to come back anytime, let us know. We'd be glad. You to let me you. know. Yeah. We okay. Will. I'll let Lincoln know. Aloha. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Bill. Aloha. Take care, brother. Thanks for tuning in to the Restore to Explore podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, we'd really appreciate you leaving a review wherever you're listening. That's the best way to support us and to help us reach more people. If you're after more free TFC education or training, looking for any of our TFC tools, natural footwear discounts, or you want specialized guidance on your foot health journey from a trusted TFC health professional, head to thefootcollective.com. All of the important links are in the show notes of the episode.